Good evening. Hello, and a big welcome here. Um, my name's Rosie Boycott, and I'm incredibly thrilled to be hosting the fourth in our series of the Earth Convention, which is 5 by 15 in partnership with Rathbone Bank. So this is the first one of the year, and so I will wish you all a very happy year. And as we all know, hopefully we're looking at the light at the end of a very long tunnel, and it will be very nice, especially about what we're talking about tonight, that we'll soon all be able to get together again and have a meal. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to Rathbones. They've been fantastic partners and they're a great bank. They know that they have to invest today for our tomorrows and not for what we're going to get today. And they have a really responsible attitude to finance. And the more one looks around, the more you can see that a lot of businesses and banks are really leading the way now on climate change while the governments, um, too often drag their feet. They have produced a, a really good series called the Planet Papers, which have been put out to accompany each of the talks that we've done. And I'm really pleased to say that they'll be out and we'll be sending them to you tomorrow. So, so far in this series, we kicked off with a brilliant session with Christiana Fugueres back in uh, September. And we looked at the impact of COVID on climate change. Then we had another session on energy and energy transition. And then as we were running up to Christmas, we did plastics and stuff, which was fantastically popular. But I have to say, food has proved to be our most popular one yet. And in addition to this, um, in a month's time, we're doing biodiversity and four weeks after that, we're going to be looking at sustainable cities. And we've got some great speakers lined up for them, but let me assure you that we are getting this new year off to a really big bang. We have got four sensational speakers. I really mean it that uh, I work in food politics and these are the people that I most want to listen to. Um, you might say, but I think probably all of you have signed off have got an inkling of it. Why does food matter so much in the climate change debate? Well. Almost every part of the food chain, if you unpick it, has some element of fossil fuels, whether it's in the transport, whether it's in the nitrates and the fertilizers, or indeed in the packaging, which is endless and awful. And indeed, just the very fact of plowing a field releases absolutely tons of carbon into the air every time they do it. Food chain is responsible for the most biodiversity loss in the world, as I think you'll be hearing. And bad diet is now the world's number one killer. It's now overtaken tobacco, as the WHO said quite recently. So there are many, many reasons why we should all be concerned about what we put on our plate, regardless of how tasty it is. So I'm incredibly pleased to welcome our speakers for tonight. And we're going to try to cover all sorts of bases in the next half an hour or so. Um, we're going to be going from the expertise of the World Bank coming to us from Washington, um, Chatham House coming to us from Yorkshire and other people from parts of the UK touching on the question of waste, the question of how to feed the world sustainably. Format's really simple. Each of our speakers, and I'll introduce them individually more properly, um, will speak for about five or six minutes. Then we'll have a chat, the five of us, and then it's over to you for your questions. So please put them in the chat box, or rather, yes, the chat box, and we will come to as many as we can. So our first speaker is Professor Tim Benton, who is in Yorkshire, where he's been watching Barn Owls, which we've been hearing about, which is fantastic. Tim leads the Energy, Environment and Resources Programme at Chatham House, and he's just published an amazing report called Food Systems Impact on Biodiversity Loss. He was a champion of the UK's global food security programme, and I'm lucky enough to have heard him speak a few times before, and I can assure you that every time I hear him speak, I learn more and I find that there's an incredible clarity and passion about what he says. So Tim, uh, can I ask you the question, just how bad is the situation? And anyway, thank you for being here and a big welcome. Over to you. Thank you very much, Rosie. Uh, you're making me blush. Uh, thank goodness my camera setting is on uh, uh, overly bright, so I look, look as though I'm a bit washed out. Um, lovely to be here, lovely to uh, see a range of familiar faces around the table. Um, so I'm just kind of teeing off with some kind of baseline statistics and views from my slightly academic perspective. I've worked on trying to understand sustainable food systems for 30 odd years as an academic and now recently moved into Chatham House to really embed myself in the kind of policy area. So just starting off, putting some flesh on the bones. 
food systems by which uh, we kind of encompass the whole of uh, production, uh, processing, retail, transport, consumption, waste of food and its impacts on health and environment. That's what we mean by the term food systems. Food systems re are responsible for uh, between 25 and 30 percent of greenhouse gas emissions on a global basis. And in rank order, the causes of the uh, emissions are first land use conversion, so that's chopping down uh, forests uh, to produce uh, new goods. Uh, second is methane emissions that come from ruminant animals and uh, wet soils. Um, so rice growing and, and things like that. Um, third, transport, cooking, etc., and the uh, distribution of food. Uh, and fourth, the fourth component is the nitrous oxide emissions that come from fertilizer and manure and so on. Now, 25 to 30% of greenhouse gas emissions on a CO2 equivalent basis are about the same as uh, domestic car use, uh, uh, domestic uh, plane travel for holidays and things like that, heating, lighting, uh, uh, cooling, uh, washing machine use, um, so almost all of what we use in the home is about the same uh, greenhouse gas emissions as our food system. And of course, of our food system, about half of that 30% is associated with the livestock provision. Um, about 80% of global deforestation is related to uh, clearance for agricultural land. And whilst that uh, rainforest, the uh, deforestation is mainly in the tropics uh, to produce things like soy, palm, cocoa, and sometimes coffee as well. Um, it does imp impact on, on us in a multitude of ways. I mean, clearly, we've got loss of biodiversity and all of the other things that are associated with that. But of course, the biggest driver for soy conversion is to produce um, a plant protein that goes into animal feed. So even though uh, our livestock system is better than many people's li many countries' livestock system, there is still a reliance sometimes on uh, concentrated feed that drives the market for deforestation. First, that was the first point. Second point, different foods have different footprints. And I think everybody who would tune into this would be aware of this. And it's not just footprints from a greenhouse gas perspective, but it's also footprints from other perspectives. So just as a, a as a, a, a headline figure, uh, a kilo of beef uses 75 times more land to produce than a kilo of tofu. It emits 25 times more greenhouse gas on average, and it provides way, way, way more pollution to air and water from fertilizer use. So different foods have different footprints. Um, and therefore, you know, if we are thinking about what does it, what makes a sustainable food system, then one of the things that we can do is think about the hierarchy of going down the footprints as we're making our food choice. And the traditional beans to chicken to be, uh, beef to chicken to beans is the kind of reflecting that sort of footprint. My third point is to a first approximation, as Rosie had said, um, poor diets on a global basis are the number one cause of mortality. And increasingly, that's mortality associated with eating diets that are very rich in calories, ultra processed food, primarily based on the starchy crops, uh, palm oil, sugar, um, uh, and some kind of generic plant protein, um, and so on, ultra processed. Um, Six, uh, fifty percent of the world's calories comes from wheat, rice, and maize. Seventy-five percent of the world's calories come from wheat, rice, and maize, plus palm, soya, sugar, um, barley, and potato. Um, and increasingly, everybody's diets are based around that from a uh, ultra-processed food perspective. All through the world, we're eating different diets, but based roughly on the same things. And given that baseline, freely available calories much more, much less available fruit and vegetables. We produce about a third of the fruit and vegetables on a global basis we should do. Were we to eat a sustainable diet, it would have more or less the same characteristics as a healthy diet in the sense it would be rich in a diversity of plants, 
crowding out meat products, uh, whole grains, and low in the refined sugars, ultra processed food, and so on. And so to a first approximation, a healthy diet is also a more sustainable diet. So we hit two things with, with one, one, two birds with one stone. Now, the final thing I, I, I'm gonna say is that we have to think not just about what is the lowest footprint diet, but also what is a sustainable food system. And from a biodiversity, from a nutrient cycle perspective, and from a whole range of other things, circular farming, uh, more resilient farming, there is an important role for livestock in the system. And if you just go down this footprint hierarchy, everybody will end up eating grain fed, i.e. Uh, we're growing grain to feed to chicken rather than eating beef. And actually, if we all ate a, less, a, a bit less of the ruminant meat, um, on a global basis, if we had, if, if we demanded about 30% of what we currently grow, uh, we could have more or less grass fed beef mm. incorporated into sustainable landscapes with circular farming, mixed arable and, and uh, uh, livestock, creating good nutrient cycling, a diverse landscape good for biodiversity and so on. So a systemic analysis and analysis of the food system might say, instead of going down this hierarchy and don't eat beef, might say, let's do the right thing from a kind of farming and landscape perspective, because sustainability is not just about greenhouse gases and think about eating less but better. And up in Yorkshire, where I live, we work with a lot of kind of local up upland farmers and thinking about, and many of them have switched to reducing the intensity of their farming, growing less, growing it more slowly, growing it better, pasture fed, not grain fed or supplement fed, um, and then selling it as a premium product for people who are eating meat as a treat rather than expecting to eat it every, every meal. So just in terms of uh, thinking about a food system and its sustainability, you have kind of two ways of thinking about it, reducing the footprint on a life cycle analysis type perspective or thinking about the food system. And I would say, let's think about both, but the food system is an important lens to look at things through because that contributes more to biodiversity savings and all, all the other things. So I suspect that's my five minutes. I will shut up now. Tim, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, as ever, I've learned a lot of things like the kilo of beef taking 75 times more land than the tofu. Um, now, I'm very pleased to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Gita Sethi, who, in fact, I first met at a conference of women in agriculture in Amsterdam, where I heard her talk and I was so blown away by her speech. And it's two years <coughs> or so have gone by and I haven't actually set eyes on her until tonight. So I'm amazingly thrilled to see her on my computer screen and joining us from Washington, where she works for the World Bank and she's the global lead on food systems and responsible for managing the World Bank's food program on food loss and waste across the world. So a lot of these things that Tim has said, Gita, you must see them in a global perspective. And um, thank you for being here in the middle of COVID and very much, um, we're so excited to have you. So over to you and welcome. Oh, thank you so much. What a warm welcome. And I'm absolutely so humbled and I'm delighted to be amongst such amazing thought leaders and pioneers. I think both what you and, and Tim said are very powerful. It's exactly right. I think this is the decade to really get food systems transformation on the right path and get the right direction uh, and so on. It is absolutely right, as Tim has said, the way we are growing food and the way we are consuming it is creating a bankrupt planet and unhealthy people. And planet proofing our food system, which is the topic for today, it could not be more important. Uh, it's a food system that in delivers people and planet. Tim's already said this, emissions from the food system is almost as high as the entire industry sector. And only 38% of emissions are covered in the, in the NDCs. So, so, I, so we hope um, that by the time the new NDCs are put in, the countries are able to put a lot more ambition. Food systems and COVID-19 has put the food systems transformation high on the radar of policymakers, both for Global North and Global South. And it's also accentuated and amplified the weaknesses and the hidden costs of the global food system and its role in healthy diets, in improving resilience during the pandemic. And we also know the challenges of the food system. 
we are going to need 56% or more food by some estimates by 2050 to feed about 10 billion. And this is without further land expansion and significantly reduce global um, GHG emissions from agriculture. A recent report, uh, Growing Better, reports that the hidden cost of the food system as we know it today is $12 trillion, 20% more than the market value of 10 trillion. And these hidden costs are felt mostly by people. The food we eat is making us sick. It also means that the current financing flows are really contributing to the vulnerabilities, weaknesses, and hidden costs of the global system. These hidden costs need to be eliminated or at least significantly reduced. And I think this is a very important message for our um, uh, audiences and ministers of finance and other policymakers of around, around the world. The implication of rethinking our financial systems around a food systems transformation is really repurposing existing financial flows. The, some estimates also suggest that the overall financing envelope for a food system fit for purpose is about 300 to 350 billion a year for the next decade. Clearly, no single institution will be able to provide these kinds of resources at this magnitude. Which means we need to put energy and really think through a food finance architecture. We need to think through the catalytic actions that could unlock significant leveraging. And I, we see really three big uh, entry points. 700 billion in annual public support to agriculture. 2 trillion north of 2 trillion in annual private sector investments into the global food system, as well as annual consumer spending on food, which is about 12 to 15% of global GDP, which is around 87 trillion. And really the big question for us is, is what, what, what are these catalytic actions that can really begin to influence the way money is being spent, where it's being spent, and therefore the kind of changes in preferences towards healthy diets. But frankly, it's also a political agenda. How else could it be explained that the global food system that is subtracting value can still count on 700 billion in public support? COVID-19 is presenting an important opportunity to get political traction on this agenda. It's putting public finances under fiscal stress, and forcing ministers of finance to really take a hard look at the effectiveness of their public support program. And the links between diets, people's immune systems, prevalence of pre-existing conditions and COVID-19, vulnerability, might cause consumers to think more actively about the importance of healthy diets. We just need to define a finance structure to change the way we are growing food, consuming food, and we, we hit upon many of the highs that we are after, human capital, planet, SDGs. And I just want to end on two, two, two more uh, uh, topics. One, I know my, my very good friend and colleague, Tristan, will pick up, is that we started thinking about food loss and waste. And when we started thinking about it a few years ago, it was not really from the food security lens alone. It was really the planet, uh, food planet lens. I, we would argue that countries cannot meet their uh, climate commitments till they have addressed their losses and understood exactly what's happening in the value chain. And the other aspect, I think Tim brought this up on, on diets and healthy diets. You know, we've done some calculations. Uh, to move from a current diet, you know, we are defining poverty lines as $1.90. But to have healthy diets, healthy, sustainable diets, the costs are anything from $3 per capita to five, which means that there needs to be a very serious rethink nationally and globally in the way we are defining these poverty lines. No longer can they be on caloric sufficiency. It has to have elements of sustainability and health built in. And no one, not one nation has, has moved fast enough on this. So let me stop there. Thanks, Rosie. Gita, thank you so much. That, I mean, you said so many interesting things. I mean, just the, um, the sort of negative 
economic impact to the food system is so starkly set out there. And also I was incredibly interested by the thing, what you said at the end about how, because one of the questions I was going to come to when we came to the chat was, you know, is food too, too cheap? And I will come back to that with you because that's, that's really stark, $1.90, but to, a difference between three to five dollars because that's huge. Anyway, with no further ado, we'll come to our third speaker, who is Tristan Stewart, who wrote an amazing book called Waste, the Global Food Waste Scandal. And I have to just tell you that how I met Tristan was when I was chairing the London Food Board, working for the then Mayor of London. And I met Tristan because he arrived and he said, I've got this idea. We're going to feed 5,000 people altogether waste food in Trafalgar Square over one lunchtime. And it was such a good idea. Anyway, we did it. And we have great pictures of these mountains of carrots and potatoes in this giant bat. And Tristram went on to take the notion of the feeding of the 5,000 all over the world. And he's a true champion of this and incredibly knowledgeable and set up a wonderful charity called Feedback as well as setting up something called Toast Ale, which takes waste, whatever it takes Tristram, and turns it into an extremely good beer, which I don't actually drink, but everyone tells me is fantastic. So Tristram, over to you. Oh, thank you, Rosie. Uh, you make my heart warm. That day, I, I remember clearly coming to see you about the Feeding the 5,000 idea. Uh, at the time, the Mayor of London has said, no way uh, can you kind of take over Trafalgar Square uh, and bring all the, the people of London together to eat a, a meal out of food waste. You somehow turned that no into a yes and changed my life for sure, 10 years um, on. Uh, as you say, we took Feeding the 5,000 to over 50 cities around the world. We sparked national movements campaigning against food waste and the world has changed. Um, when I started campaigning on the issue before I wrote the book, food waste was just not on the political agenda. Big companies sweeping it under the carpet, public awareness at a very low level. Um, and, and the world has really dramatically uh, changed since then. You can't be a big company uh, in food without having a food waste strategy. Uh, we now have a sustainable development goal, a target that I even call for in my book of halving food waste by 2030 is something that all the nations of the earth have signed up to. Um, so I see a lot of uh, positives there. The British public at the very forefront of this movement, indeed, per capita, British people have reduced their food waste by one third uh, since records began, which is one of the few really big mass behavior change, environmental achievements that you can point to and concretely say um, there was a, a, a grassroots movement here supported from the top by government, measured along the way uh, by our NGO partners, the Waste and Resources Action Program, it's real, had real impact mm. across the board. So whilst I absolutely concur with the very bleak outlook that the food system is the single biggest negative impact that humans have on planet Earth for all the reasons that we've heard. I also want to emphasize that whilst I am myself privately a deep, dark pessimist, I do hold on to the view that we have a hope. We can turn things around really quite quickly. And the good news is that we already know how to do farming in a way that can replenish aquifers rather than depleting them, create habitat, rather than destroy it. And indeed, uh, plants have, for billions of years now, been doing the great job of sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into soils. And indeed, agriculture, I would argue, is the single biggest opportunity we have for sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into soils. At the same time, we'll be building soils, building fertility, building soil retention in those soils. And that system can be created through a combination, I believe, of individual behavior change. This is our responsibility. We eat our way through this problem every day. We can buy our way out of it by buying ecologically harmonious uh, foods, but also, of course, public policy. Um, Gita quite eloquently pointed to the $700 billion that are spent. That's a million dollars a minute uh, on supporting agriculture, only 1% of which, as the food and land use coalition pointed out uh, in their report two years ago, uh, which I think was actually last time I saw you, Gita, um, on uh, 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 only 1% of that is spent on ecological farming. Um, and we just need to flip that and say, no, we're going to support ecological farming. I've spent the day, I can't resist telling you, uh, with a very 
wonderful guy, Derek Gao, who anyone who's into rewilding will have heard of. He reintroduces beavers and water voles and all sorts of animals across the country. And we're planning uh, to do that here in, in my valley. I have a conservation grazing project. Um, the, the cattle grazed area on the heathland, I just saw a pallid harrier, which is a really special bird of play flying over the heathland, maintained by the cattle. The woodlarks are just starting. Ecological farming is not just possible, it's, it's one that enriches uh, wildlife and landscapes uh, if it's done really sensitively, uh, if we also eat less meat and less dairy, as Tim quite rightly pointed out. But Rosie, I want to come back to uh, food waste since you've asked me to talk about it, or rather what we should be doing about it. You mentioned coming together at, uh, around a meal in your introduction, uh, introdu introductory remarks. Now, everyone is yearning for that time when we can come together around a meal again. I myself, I, it's the thing that I miss most. Um, and it comes to, to my favorite word. My favorite word is companion. Uh, com is uh, the Latin for with, and pan is the Latin for bread. A companion is literally somebody you share food with. And indeed, the sharing of food to build friendship is a universal human behavior. It's practiced in every society all over the world. It goes deep into our social networks. Indeed, it is a, a great ape behavior. Uh, in one form or another, all the great apes participate in the politics of food sharing. My favorite, the bonobos, uh, our closest animal relative, the pygmy chimpanzees, um, proactively, when they have surplus food, they will go out and find other bonobos to share that food with, thus turning surplus food into social capital. They are essentially making new friends with that food. They, they prefer to share their food with strangers over and above uh, bonobos they already know. Um, and I, I find this a, a, a lovely way of looking at the problem of food waste. It's not just that food waste is one of the top three ways we can reduce carbon dioxide emissions simply by sharing the food, both on a local and geopolitical level. But it's also a great way of building friendships. Think of all those friends we would make if uh, we shared our food rather than throwing away well, 1.3 billion tons of food that humans throw away every year. And I like that way of thinking about it because it's almost a, a hedonistic approach to the environmental campaign. Let's squeeze every last drop, every last drop of deliciousness of friendship out of every meal that we possibly can. And that's been the ethos at the heart of feeding the 5,000, uh, having a massive party to try and uh, solve the world's problems. It, it's at the heart of toast ale. We upcycle surplus bread, turn it into beer, liquid companionship, if you like, and use that as a way of bringing people together around the vision that we can reform our food system in a way that it's going to replenish our lives, nourish us, but also be in good companionship with our fellow humans and the earth. That's my manifesto. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tristan. That was that was absolutely great. Um, thank you. Again, yes, toast made out of bread. I should have got that. That was a bit slow on the uptake. Um, our last speaker, and by no means our least in any way, is Anthony Warner. And he previously wrote a book called The Angry Chef, which brilliantly debunked crazy diets. Um, controversial, but very, very good. His new book is called Ending Hunger, The Quest to Feel, Feed the World Without Destroying It. So Anthony has actually taken on everything that everyone, has. there's a copy of the book and we've got the details online. It's a great read. I mean, there is so much research in this book. It was hard to know what to pick out to ask Anthony to talk about because actually he's he, he goes across this whole range. But you're very... Um, everyone's touched a bit on meat or actually a lot on meat. I mean, the meat section in your book is very strong, I thought. I mean, if you, you know, please say a bit about that, but if there's other things, because your book is also optimistic because it says there is a way, picking up all sorts of things that other people have said, there is a way we can do this. It isn't actually rocket science, it's politics, isn't it? Anthony, yeah. over to you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, yeah. I, I, Going to talk about meat a little bit, as you said, the book covers um, such a such a broad area. I couldn't possibly fit, fit, fit everything in, in in one small talk. Um, so, but meat is incredibly important. Meat, is, as as all the panelists have pretty much mentioned it, um, and the impact, the environmental impact of meat is absolutely huge. And it is quite an inefficient way to produce edible protein, unfortunately. And as a result, it uses eighty three percent of world farmland. 
and you know, 60, 50, 60% of all greenhouse gases related to agriculture are produced because of livestock production. Um, but it also only produces 18% of our calories or, and about 37% of our protein. So that's an incredibly inefficient way, really. You know, cows particularly use a lot of energy, um, mooing, pooing and chewing, as I, I, I put it. And it's, um, you know, and as Tim said, one kilogram of beef protein uses 150 or so times the greenhouse gases, 100 times the land compared to one kilogram of soya. Um, and perhaps almost as importantly as well, I would say different animals, like particularly pigs and chickens, consume about one third of all the world's cereal grain produced. Actually, in the UK, probably sort of 60, 70 percent of all the cereal grain we grow in this country gets fed to fed to animals. And, and around the world, that's one billion tons of edible, edible, human edible food gets fed to livestock, which would be enough to feed about three and a half billion people. Um, and in a world where we have 800 million people who just literally don't have enough food to eat, that just seems like it, that can't be a fair system. And the thing about meat as well is even though we are eating too much of it now, that is increasing what, about three and a half, four percent every year. And we will almost have doubled perhaps um, by 2050 the amount of meat we're eating, which is an incomprehensible impact that can have on the food system. But there are two camps here and there is a dichotomy and I think that's always a problem you know on one side we have um, people very strong vegan advocates saying we should give up all meat and on the other side we have a lot of people saying oh meat's fine stop picking on it you know we should stop flying um, and I think both sides are wrong to be honest um, and I think there is a is a case for meat within our within our food system that, that isn't very often made in some of these some of these debates um, you know for a start, two billion people around the world do rely on ag animal agriculture for their livelihood in some way. And if everyone stops eating meat, we have to find something for those people to be able to make a living. And often they're living in marginal areas of the world where animal agriculture is the only viable form of, of food production. So if you tell them to not eat meat, then they'd, 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 probably, they'd probably starve. And we can't, we can't do that. There's, there's an awful lot of people rely on it. And also, you know, in, in this country, we have, um, you know, um, livestock and we have arable agriculture. And they're very, very separate. But most of the world's food is produced on smaller mixed farms. And there are a lot of really valuable synergies between between animal and, and arable agriculture. You know, animals can pull plows, they can control weeds, they can transport goods around, they consume crop residues, they provide fertilizers, they can provide financial security to people, um, which is incredibly important. You know, they can consume food waste as well in, in terms of swill. Um, and uh, you know, some, also some animal produce is quite important for people's nutrition status. In a country like ours, you know, we can probably be quite healthy on a vegan diet and we have access to nutrition and and fortified foods and supplements but in, in a lot of parts of the world some agri agriculture some animal agriculture some animal products can make a huge difference in nutrition status and you know perhaps two billion people in the world have inadequate diets in terms of micronutrients so that's an incredibly important thing um, and also putting some animals in a system can make it more efficient in terms of land use, which is obviously such an important environmental metric. Um, and often, and, and I've done it, and Tim's done it as well, we, we, do, we do contrast the worst animals produced on the poorest land with the best plants on the best land. Soil is particularly good. Um, you know, but if you, if you look at how much sort of uh, protein per hectare you can produce. Some foods, some, some plant foods are terrible. You know, things like, things like celery and tomatoes and cabbage, and they're, they're terrible in terms of the amount of protein you produce on, a, on, a, on an area of land. But we don't criticize them because we want people to eat more fruits and vegetables. I think that's a good thing that everyone, everyone in this panel would agree on, I'm sure. Um, and, you know, I, I think we should probably think about meat in a different way. And we should think about it in the same way as we think about it as vegetables. You know, it, it is quite, it is an efficient way to produce protein and, and, and nutrients, but it also provides valuable nutrition for people. It gives people pleasure. It has a lot of cultural importance and it has a unique flavor, which is incredibly hard to replicate. And the problems only occur when we massively open, over consume it like we do, when we, when it dominates our diets and when we see them as staples, we have to eat every meal. Um, you know, the problem with meat is that we just eat far too much of it and we need to consume it far less and we need to value it more and I would prefer that instead of arguing constantly about sort of burps and farts and, and, and emissions we should find ways to make that behavior change happen so I think that's a big challenge we don't talk about enough oh okay sorry I put the questions up 
Thank you, Anthony. That was really good. Um, that was great. Um, yes, I think that's very interesting that you talk about things like cabbages and lettuce. Um, I always remember reading something about iceberg lettuce saying that it had almost zero calorific value and almost zero benefit. And yet we look at it and it takes up acres of space and an immense amount of effort in distribution and plastic wrapping and things like that. And yet it's deemed as healthy. And I think that's a, that's a point that is very rarely made, but there are so many things. We've got lots of questions coming in. So I'm not gonna keep you very long before we bring in the audience, but I do really want to come back to that point of Gita's that she made about, because it was also my top question. And I'd really like to get I mean, can I come to you first, Tim, and then come back to you, Gita, maybe to talk about it a bit more. Is, I mean, food is clearly too cheap, isn't it? Is there a way around this, this particular stumbling block? Uh, yes, um, in the sense that we have designed our food system based on the principle that food should become ever cheaper and ever more available. And that worked for a time, but we've now gone too far uh, in the sense that, by in, uh, uh, by thinking about intensifying food production and globalizing our food supply chains, opening up competition at a global basis, we have incentivized a production system based on producing cheap calories at scale with high environmental input. And because of the, uh, the uh, global nature of the competition, any country that uh, subsidizes its food production by driving the environment in the wrong direction gets a competitive advantage so that drives the race to the bottom so we end up with this spiral that just we're forever driving up production driving down driving up the impacts driving down price and people are expecting it um, but I think so so we need to find a way of making sure that the real costs of food production are reflected into prices and that means perhaps on average raising food prices as Gita said but the other item in the toolbox is, as, as has been mentioned by Gita and Tristram, we spend a hell of a lot of money on subsidies, and those subsidies are primarily re reflected on grain. And we did some modelling for the Global Panels Foresight report uh, published last year that indicates if you take subsidies off grain on a global basis, um, say put them on fruit and vegetables, you would drive up the availability of fruit and vegetables. So you drive down the price of fruit and vegetables. You drive up the price of grain. You therefore drive up the price of meat as well. And so you drive down the availability, uh, change diets just by changing the subsidy structure. And if you move towards a relatively healthy, relatively low meat diet on a global basis, just by shifting subsidies, you can change the whole global price equation and other than for the very poorest in the in the world and they, they obviously need support but for the majority of the world's population um, food prices will be cheaper if we switch to a kind of flexitarian meat as a treat type diet than uh, as we have now and we'd solve our environmental issues and, and all the rest of that and I think the final key thing I would say is that when we look ahead, we often make the assumption that diets in the future are going to be the same as diets today. Mm. And if you make that assumption, then you get the ridiculous figures, Not, I'm not being critical of, of Gita, but they're, they're floating in the literature, that we need 40% more food. But if you think about food waste as an inefficiency, if you think about overeating calories as an inefficiency, and most of the Western world overeat by about 30% calories, between 20 and 30% physiologically, You've got a 50% saving in the food system by eating properly. And if we ate in a different, if we ate in a more structured way, actually, as Anthony said, you know, we feed enough calories to the global meat uh, livestock industry to feed the entire population of Asia. So we could manage on a global basis as a first approximation with the sorts of agricultural resources that we currently use, but it would require us to do things in different ways. Over. Okay. Thank you, thank you. That's a very really comprehensive answer, Gita. Can you can you pick up on that in terms of um, when you look at say world subsidies? If we can swizzle them around, can we really start to change things, or do we need carbon taxing, for instance? Uh, absolutely, Rosie. It's always nice to come after Tim because he touches all the right pulse points, so, so it's easy to follow. Um, you know, all systems work um, with a given objective, but it's very important, as Tim has said, that maybe we've gone too far. 
And I think those, the subsidies were very important when they were designed, but at this point in time, they really need to be repurposed because the kind of subsidies being given to producers for certain crops, mostly grains, and for consumers, again, in a very largely caloric sufficiency, not about really nutrient sufficiency, can change, can, can, can have a much bigger impact. And then you're exactly right, food's not priced right. I mean, the food loss and waste, we did some modeling uh, because it was fascinating to, I mean, if one steps back and thinks about this, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the Nissan as a company doesn't create, uh, make three cars and throws one out, right? So why do we do it in food? And it's really about the pricing. It makes it, uh, low pricing makes it easier to just throw it out without thinking. And we talk about opportunity cost and this cost and that cost. And across the entire value chain, if we reflect prices that adequately do incorporate environmental costs, so real cost of producing, the, the numbers of losses and waste come down to very acceptable numbers, acceptable levels. But it's a very hard message right now to give the world when there's so much of an income shock, food insecurity has been growing. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so there has, and yet, as, as I had mentioned, that affordable diets is not a dollar 90. It has to be very, a very different number, at least three times that amount. And maybe the repurpose subsidy could come in form of some income support that people can then make the right choices that work for them. But in a way that doesn't create the kind of system we are seeing where, you know, it's not helping the planet, it's not helping the economy and definitely not helping people. No, Tristram, yes, I mean, that, that's a really interesting point. I love, I love that analogy that Nissan don't make four cars and reckon that they're going to chuck one out the window. I mean, when you put it like that, you could kind of, you know, you think you might as well shoot yourself. But um, how, do we, how do we get people to, I mean, I, one thing that say worries me is that you see that the big supermarkets now say they have almost zero waste in themselves. But in fact, so much of their food is packaged into like, you have to end up with five courgettes when what you wanted was one courgette and that they lurk around in the back of the fridge and then finally they're just not much good anymore. And that there has been a sort of slight outsourcing of waste back to the individual. Do you think that's true? Oh, are you asking me? Absolutely. Yeah, I am you know, you. You're you know, I think, you know I think it's true, Rosie. Uh, okay, so the supermarkets are the most powerful entity within the supply chain in Western countries. Uh, there's uh, hundreds of thousands of suppliers, factories and farmers, millions and millions of customers, but only uh, five or six supermarkets that dominate the vast majority of the grocery sales in any individual country in, in Western Europe and North America. And of course, that allows them to offload or outsource, as you put it, Rosie, their waste. First on to consumers, um, the entire business model, even of the most progressive supermarkets, is to create this cornucopian vision of abundance. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they do that is their principal marketing tool. They've invested millions of dollars in working out what it is that makes you and I trigger that response uh, to take that product and put it into our, into our trolley. And the cornucopian abundance vision is the single most powerful way of triggering that. If you're at a feast, and there is a huge smorgasbord of delicious food, you will eat more than mm. if there's a small amount of food on the table. Same as when you go into a supermarket. And uh, so their entire business model is based on that. Uh, going up the supply chain, of course, they offload their waste typically onto farmers who grow food uh, to a forecast. But then at the last minute, the forecast is different. They found cheaper bananas uh, in Guatemala this year. They've got uh, beans from, uh, from, from, uh, from Chile rather than uh, from Kenya, the Kenyan farmers have to leave all their crops in the field. And I've never felt more ashamed of my, my origins than when I'm standing talking to Kenyan smallholders about the fact that supermarkets in this country have canceled an order or rejected it because it doesn't um, look perfect. Um, but all of this points to food waste, not just as an individual problem, that we all do actually have the power to help alleviate, thus relieving the environmental uh, pressure um, that results from growing all of that food that we, no one eats, uh, as well as relieving the pressure on food supplies um, and thus helping the 
800 million or so hungry people in the world access more food simply by, by not wasting food. But it points to that core issue um, that uh, Tim quite rightly raised, which is that food waste is the single most obvious way of demonstrating that the corporate-led productionist paradigm, this idea that we need to double food production by 2050 or increase it by 50, 60, 70 percent or else what billions of people are going to starve, that that paradigm is not about meeting the actual needs of the human population, let alone of ensuring that planet Earth is contained within a sustainable system and that the food system sits within that rather than destroying it. The principal motive, I would argue, of that productionist paradigm is the capital, uh, the, the, the capitalist necessity of, of generating profit. Now, I do not say that generating profit is a bad thing. We try desperately to do that at Toastale. But I am saying that when profit is pursued at the expense of survival of life on Earth, you have a food system that is being driven by the wrong imperative. It is not a food system that is primarily um, aimed at feeding people. Feeding people is almost a byproduct. It is a food system yeah. that is dominated by the need to generate profit. And I've seen in the q and I just had a look down, lots of people asking about, you know, what are the policies that people can do? Well, I'm going to point to one if I can have just 30 seconds to do it. In fact, the UK government has just closed a radical consolation, con consultation on banning all online advertising of junk food. That is the food system's jugular. The reason why everyone goes for all of this unhealthy food is because it is very successfully advertised. And that is why companies invest so many billions of dollars into marketing their junk food brands on all of the media that people are saturated in. It is a very successful way of selling stuff. If we can say, no, actually, we're going to protect our populace from obesogenic uh, foodstuffs by just saying, well, you can't advertise this stuff, that would be an amazing piece of government policy. Uh, and, and really, hats off to the British government for even considering it. Well, well it's, been a, it's been a long fight, that one, but it's, it's really good that it's coming through. And so is the nine o'clock watershed, I think, pretty soon as well. So, Anthony, um, coming to you, all of these things have been said. I know you talk about them. <laughs> a lot in your book, but something that Tristan said that I thought was really interesting that I, I know you, you touch on, you go into a supermarket and you think, oh my God, there's half a million different kinds of food, which they kind of probably are. But in fact, those foodstuffs are made from incredibly few basic products. It's a sort of massive con, this notion of diversity. And, you know, now the more we learn about, say, the, the, how the gut works, we realize that, in fact, we're feeding it, rice, grain, we, you know, these very, very narrow bands. I mean, do you see that as like a, a, a big problem? And also when you talk about feeding the world sustainably, what's your, what's your answer to how we move on from that? Um, um, Sorry, big question. You've got two yeah, minutes. That's a big, that's a big question. You've got um, so many questions now. The, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it is a problem. There's a, there's a limit, you know, there's a limited number of ingredients of which most of our food is based, and that's a problem, and that comes from what everyone's been discussing. It comes from a subsidy system which has promoted the growth of those though that, that small range of crops and that small um, uh, you know, amount of livestock production. And that's problematic. And, and then, you know, the, this, this sort of huge potential $700 billion lever, which you, where you, is, is such a, you know, is probably the, one of the biggest things you could do to try and create a better food system, give us all more, more, more sort of um, food diversity and, and, and allow more crop, different types of um, crops to be to, to be grown and eaten and, and um, allow us to have, have better foods. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I think in, you know, my, my big thing that I, I want to try and help you to promote is, is to encourage people to eat more plant protein rather than animal protein. And there are really great options. I, you know, I'm incredibly worried about how we manage to do that. I'm incredibly worried about how we manage to persuade people to eat less meat. You know, I want, uh, you know, I think there's, there's an amount of meat which people should be eating. Lots of the world eats way too much. Lots of the world probably do be eating a few more animal products for their nutrition status. We need them to sort of come together and meet right in the middle. And that's an incredibly difficult thing to try and achieve in terms of shifting behaviors. You know, if you make meat more expensive, 
I, I, I struggle to know how you'll prevent that from making it inaccessible for people without money and, and eaten by, by people with, with lot, all of them by people with lots of money. Um, and, you know, we need to really think about those things of behaviour change. For me, it's about promoting, you know, making plant protein a, a desirable option, the, the mm. food that the world aspires to eat. And that requires, you know, some very clever um, behavioural science on a global scale. And I'm not sure there's much precedent to that happening. Perhaps the sort of transition from eating beef to chicken between the, over the last sort of uh, 60 years or so might be some sort of precedent in that, but it's an incredibly difficult thing to direct in a certain way. But that's the big challenge that we need to be talking about. There's lots of people looking at how we should be eating and how much meat we should be consuming. There's not enough really thoughtful work on how we can actually make that sort of behavior change happen. Um, and yeah. uh, you know, that, that's the sort of discussion that I want um, my book to try and sort of start get, no, no, get people having. I think it does that brilliantly. And actually this, what you've just said <laughs> picks up, a, I'm going to now go into the questions. Question here from Alistair Johnson, um, which is for Tristan, but in a way it's also for everybody. You're saying that behavior change has led to a third reduction in food waste. How do you think this was achieved? And could this be easily replicated across other areas of food, like meat, which we're obviously talking about? Is there a tipping point? And, and then the big question, which then if you can answer it, Tristan, I'd like to come to Geeta and to Tim. Can these things be done without government intervention? Or do we need them to step in? And in which case, how? So if you could start by just talking about whether behavior change, because I agree with you, I mean, the, the food waste thing has really, it has become a bit like, you know, smoking indoors or um, driving without a seatbelt or, or various things like that, that you just sort of don't do anymore. Right, exactly. And mass behavior change is, is the kind of holy grail of all environmental and many other agendas and how to achieve it is the subject of numerous books and studies. What I can share from my own uh, track history and uh, role in creating mass behavior change, uh, the bit that I like best at least is the one I touched on earlier, that if you want to throw a work, uh, a if you want to change the world, you you've got to throw a better party than the people destroying it. Uh, listen, if we go into a room and start making angry noises and shouting at people to turn the music down and, and stop eating this and stop eating that, no one's going to want to even be at our party. They're going to go at somebody else's party. If we lay on the most cornucopian delicious feast of sustainable foods and advocate for how brilliant it is and how delicious and tasty and how it can be cooked into this and the coolest people and the sexiest people are at this party drinking toast ale, of course, that's when people will come and join our party. That's how we're going to create the global movement. Now, that doesn't mean we can't be angry it doesn't mean we can't grieve about the colossal ecological losses that are going on on a daily basis at the hands of our rapacious food system. Of course, we remain connected to the earth and its losses and, and the anger and the grief that can come with that. But what we put out there into the world is the celebratory solutions that really actually exist. And I mentioned, of course, Toast Ale is, is the company that I founded, but there are now hundreds of food businesses that are specifically tackling the issue of just food waste, way more on alternative meats, sustainable meats, alternative to dairy. You know, these are the kinds of ways in which business and people mm -hmm. can come together to reshape the food system. Should governments have a role? Obviously, laws are there as a codification of public morals. We've seen on the issue of food waste, of course, our own government, the Groceries Code Adjudicator Act that banned supermarkets from cancelling orders at the last minute. We've seen the French law on supermarket food waste. We've seen long-standing laws on subsidising or giving tax breaks for food redistribution. Of course they have to have a role. Of course they should be funding public awareness, raising and nudging populations. But most importantly, government's role is to regulate business. Not because regulating business is bad for companies, it's good for companies. Tim mentioned the race to the bottom. Unless you tell companies you're not allowed to use extremely dangerous prophylactic use of antibiotics, they have to do that. Otherwise, the cattle farmer down the road who does use prophylactic antibiotic use to boost the productivity yep. of their cattle will go into, the, into business and everyone else will go out of business. So you have to have regulation for any of these things to work. 
thank you for that. And also thank you for touching on the antibiotics because I see we've got a lot of questions about that. Gita, where do you see the role of government coming in in terms of reining in and changing the system, which we've all talked about? Uh, Rosie, what you correctly said when we started this conversation, price the food right. And the only way food can be priced right is if this whole public support is given a serious rethink and repurposed. And that's going to be, the, the I, in, in my mind, a very strong, blunt instrument that does bring about a systemic change in the way we are producing and also then what people consume. It's going to have an impact. If food's priced right, people are not going to throw one third out. They're going to think mm -hmm. twice about it. Um, so I think that's, um, that's, that is, to me, the most important agenda for a government to think through. So who, I mean, given that a step like that to start to like pay for the externalities of food or however you want to look at it. You can't, no single country is going to do it on its own. It, it, it's one of those things that's sort of got to be tackled on a global level because we have a global food system. Absolutely, you're exactly right. Exactly what Tristram just said. No one person can be the good guy. There has to be global governance really across the food system. Uh, and because also we, we, we need to have food flow. I mean, uh, crisis can only be managed if there is a free movement of food. So absolutely, there needs to be a global governance and food systems. Um, so do you see that coming in in, in, the, in the same way that we got the Paris Agreement about carbon emissions that you would, I mean, when we get the Global Food Summit later this year, that, that, that there would start to be international agreement to stop the race to the bottom? there has to be something done. So there are many events. There is the G7 with Britain now at the presidency. Uh, food and climate is on the agenda. There is the Glasgow food and climate. There is a UN food summit. Mm -hmm. and, and so <laughs> there are many, many global events that are also giving the same message. So absolutely, the whole story on climate needs to be now taken much deeper, much sectoral into the food systems. Tim, how do you see that, that um, how, do you, how could that system change come about realistically? <laughs> Sorry, small question. That, that's a good question. So um, I, I do think that we've got to find a way of greening trade but from a slightly nerdy perspective, I've been caught up in the UK's Trade and Agricultural Commission Standards Working Group, and I've learned far more about the way that global trade is governed than I thought I ever wanted to know. But from an official WTO perspective, there is no simple mechanism of building in general environmental uh, um, internalization of externalities or border control there is when it comes to safety, and you could argue that climate change is creating a human safety issue, but it's a little bit of a stretch. We need, and there isn't anything for biodiversity, we don't have a global standard of what good biodiversity sustainable farming would be, and without having a global standard, the WTO rules won't be able to be applied to biodiversity. So there's a lot of mucking around with the kind of techn technological detail that is needed. But the principal thing is that we need governments, parties to the WTO to want to change. And there is still largely, I mean, there is a European drive to get these things on the agenda. But from a lot of the world, there is a drive to keep them off the agenda. So I do think that this super year of uh, climate change COP, biodiversity COP, food system summit, Nutrition for Growth Summit as well in Japan. All of these things are big international meetings where food is prominent. And if there is enough of a discussion about it, then there might be an opportunity for a country like the UK. We keep on talking about global Britain. Where can we show leadership? We are showing leadership in some things to do with trade. We've got a kind of due diligence requirement uh, that we're working towards for forestry supply chains and so on. But the real issue, I think, is not that we want people, uh, citizens who are also consumers, to change the system from within by changing their diets and changing the market pressure. What we really want is for citizens who are also consumers to make this a politically important hmm. 
uh, issue and then start getting our politicians to be elected based on their green credentials. That's the way that we'll get change because no amount of, you know, you can, if you're really, really niche, eat sustainably in the UK. But if you have to eat anything that is not niche, there is no transparency in the system. You know, I've been a professor of ecology for decades and I've worked on sustainable agriculture forever. And I can't go into a supermarket and buy sustainable food because the transparency is too low. I yeah, can't but, even buy a pork pie and know that the pork in it comes from Britain or Denmark or somewhere else, the transparency seller. So we need government, we need people to be active and we need government to respond to that and we need more transparency to allow consumers to drive the system, but we need government to regulate because otherwise we get this race to the bottom that somebody will cheat on the system and if it's not in the UK, they will cheat in some other country overseas. Yeah, well, I, that, that's a really well put, that all that. And um, I'm afraid we're sort of out of time, but we've got an incredible amount of questions. I mean, just one really good point that came up from someone called Rose Lewis, you know, which was, you know, how much of, you, we'd really make a big step forward if supermarkets didn't tell, sell us stuff based on price. And in the UK, 40% of all our food is bought on offers, either these buy one, get one freeze or, or whatever it is. So you end up with more food. I mean, as Tristan says, it's it's like this thing, you walk in and you get too much. And I go cold water swimming and I was in Minehead today. And every time I drive to the seafront in Minehead, I have to pass the drive-in McDonald's. And every time I check the length of the queue, and I kid you not, there are always about 20 to 30 cars sitting in this interminable queue, waiting for the drive-in drive into McDonald's. And it makes my heart sink, which then of course is alleviated the moment I get in the sea in the <laughs> six degrees that it is now, but it certainly wakes you up. But I think we might leave it though at this point by going around everybody, because a lot of people have asked for specific things that they could do. I mean, I'm not gonna allow you all to say, don't waste food, because I think we've all <laughs> agreed on that one. So I want some, different ideas before we love you and leave you and love you and leave you to our audience and apologies in advance to people whose questions have not been asked. So let me start with um, Gita. What would you suggest the, I mean, citizen power does work. It has worked to some degree about food waste as Tristan has said. So as a citizen in our developed world, what would you say we should do? Uh, it's a very good question, um, Rosie, uh, and we, and of course I can't use the word don't waste food, um, <laughs> but I think we can definitely see what where our food is coming from, uh, and just that lens itself can have a big impact in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 the seasonality issue, supporting our smallholders, our local farmers, and reducing carbon footprint. Perfect. Anthony, what would you recommend that we do? And you're not allowed food waste. No, um, no I, I think I'm probably going to echo to some extent what Tim said. Um, you know, I, I, I worry that when we push it too much back onto the consumer and say, don't eat this, do eat this, and, and make people feel guilty about their food choices. We need to make it a political issue. It needs to define who you vote for. It needs to define who's in power and, and how you invest your money. You know, if you have money, if you're lucky enough to have money to invest, where you put that money and make sure it's going into places which are, you know, benefiting, benefiting the environment. Um, and, and that way we will, is the only real way we'll actually achieve change. And, and you can achieve change like that way as a, as a citizen. Great. Tim. Um, so, yeah, I would uh, very much echo uh, Anthony's point in the sense that, as you mentioned, I was the champion of the UK's global food security programme and I started off hating the term champion because my mother used to call me Wonder Horse all the time. Uh, but then I grew into the term and I loved the fact that it was a kind of ambassadorial role and I was going around the world talking to people and and raising the issue up the debate. So as well as the politicisation uh you know, whether you want to join the Extinction Rebellion or whether you just want to talk to your friends about some of these issues and get people deliberating about food and being deliberative about choices. That for me, champion and the fact that the food system could be different if only we had the political power to change it. It's, it's we know what to do. It's just politicians won't get reelected if they do it at the moment because they don't see any votes in it. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Tristan, what would be your sign off? 
Eat, eat less meat and, and dairy, but use your food, your reformed food, to make friends, to, to use companionship as a way of, we're a social animal and using peer-to-peer -peer influence, phenomenally powerful. But um, Anthony just touched on the one I was really going to talk about, and which is money. Um, company has the same etymology as companion. <laughs> a company is a group of people that come together to share bread. Bread, in this sense, of course, is metaphorical. Oh, it's ironic that being hosted by Rathbones, we've hardly touched on banking. Banking and pension funds represent the mass democratization mm -hmm. of capital. We are the owners of all of the companies that we're talking about that are chopping down the Amazon rainforest, polluting rivers, creating plastic and spewing it out into the ocean. We own those companies. And being alive to your power as an owner and user of money, of course your food choices on a daily basis matter, but your money choices, where do you put your money if you've got any? You know, Rathbones, I may as well come out. I've had some, I've got some money in uh, Rathbones, Green Bank, environmental uh, uh, um, nice. focused investments. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, uh, I'll put my hand up and admit to that. Um, and, you know, there are organizations now, Triodos Bank has high street, uh, uh, you know, um, individual bank accounts available for people. This is the way money needs to flow downhill into the ecological capital and that exists we need to create and allow that good economy to thrive well that's a very nice note to end on that we need a good economy and it works very well with our partners and uh we're great to be it's great to be with you rathbones because i know you're doing exactly that and i would say that this is the year that food needs to get political just hearing about all these different things that are coming up and someone said earlier you know the disruptor that's happened in the energy systems, the understanding of the contribution to climate change. We're now beginning to see that food is just as big an issue as any other carbon emissions system on earth. And in a way, to me, it's the bigger one because it's also about our health and it's about our biodiversity. So I can't thank you all enough. Gita, Anthony, Tim and Tristan, thank you for being with us. Thank you to Rathman. Thank you to everybody who joined in and for sending in so many questions, nearly 100, and I'm so sorry we haven't got to more, but I hope that many of your questions, I can see the sort of general things that we did manage to answer. Um, please buy, um, well, Tristan's book is now quite old, but it's also absolutely great. And Anthony- Just reprinted. Uh, what? Just reprinted. been reprinted. Oh, fine, okay. Tristan's book has just been reprinted. And if you want to know really a lot about how the food system works, get hold of Anthony's book about ending hunger because it really does tell you from right back in the agricultural revolution to right up to the future, what we're doing. Uh, Tim's report can be downloaded from Chatham House. And it's, uh, even if you just read the executive summary, it's great. And it's free, it's free. Oh, it's, all right, it's free. <laughs> and so is this talk. So is <laughs> <laughs> and tomorrow you will have the Rathbones Planet Papers about this session. And of course, we will be able to, you can watch this again anytime you like online. Um, join us again in four weeks time. Uh, we'll be talking about biodiversity and climate. And we'll be joined by Professor Parta Dasgupta, who has just produced the Dasgupta report. Um, and I can assure you it's going to be another great evening. But in the meantime, enjoy your dinner. Good night. <laughs>